Track and Field Black History. We are here speaking with one of the most legendary coaches, and uh, we'll talk about some of his background as well, but he's a legend in the sport of track and field. I, I feel like, to a degree, you've probably been influenced by what he's done, whether you've you know, had an athlete that you're you know, related to, or maybe you're a fan of an athlete that he's worked with, but we are coaching, uh, talking with Coach Lawrence Johnson, Willie Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, brother. And just tell us, how are you feeling about your athletes going into this weekend at Prefontaine? I feel good about uh, the preparation work we've done to, you know, get to this point in the season. Again, you know, everything for us is always preparation for the U.S. championships and world championships and beyond. So, pre is a... Uh, we treat all the Diamond Leagues and the meets kind of like dress rehearsal to the big meets, uh, which is championships uh, part of the season. So I feel good about the preparation that we've done thus far. Um, we're not here, you know, Prefontaine pulling out all the stops, but we are prepared to have some nice uh, competitions for where we are in the season. And the athletes are, um, you know, strong and they're prepared and uh, mentally focused, ready to go. It's just another step for us in preparation for the U.S. championship. So we feel good about these. Hopefully the weather holds up uh, this weekend so we can have some good competitions across the board. Yeah, nice. Um, and so you were mentioning that you went to the University of Arkansas. I mean, you competed there in the 400 and uh, a couple other events, right? So mm -hmm. talk about what got you not only into track, but like to the University of or um, Arkansas and what that experience was like. Uh, well, for me, everything was kind of, you know, it was very calculating and it's very strategic from, you know, choosing Arkansas. At the time, I think, you know, Arkansas, we had, you know, 39, 40 national championships. And so my whole goal, you know, growing up was to be a teacher and a coach. And so I chose Arkansas because I thought it was the best program in the country to be a part of. There's probably a lot of other programs that probably would have been you know, more suited for my particular skill set. Arkansas was known more for uh, the distance runners and the, and the jumpers. Um, but the coach that had originally recruited me out of high school was actually the sprint coach there. So we decided, so I decided to go over there. It's the best school in the country at the time. So selfishly it was for me, you know, I, I didn't mind taking a backseat as an athlete in order to be around some of the best coaches in the world. So I could gain the knowledge from Coach McDonald, who was the head coach at the time, and Coach Sylvia, who was the sprint coach at the time, and Dick Booth, all legendary coaches and Hall of Fame coaches at this point. I just wanted to acquire the knowledge that they had because I knew I would go on to be a track coach in some capacity, and, I, and that's my whole reason for going there. What better classroom could I be in being surrounded by some of the best coaches in the world, some of the best athletes in the world, and they would... And they and I wanted to go somewhere where the, it wasn't sprint heavy because you know I, I felt like I'd been around some pretty good sprint coaches in my in my time as an athlete yeah. and I learned so much from Coach McDonald as a distance long and middle distance coach and yeah. so many things from Coach Booth as a as a uh, jump coach as well as things from my sprint coach Coach Sylvie at the time so I gained a wealth of knowledge of just being at the U of A and all the professional athletes that train there. So right. selfishly, <laughs> being a coach and a teacher, I went to Arkansas for that reason, and it was probably one of the best decisions that I ever made uh, in my life at that point. Um, I met my wife there, and we have kids <laughs> there that are graduating from high school. So being at the University of Arkansas and uh, prepared me for a lot of things, not only professionally, but personally as well. Yeah, and can you talk about that, especially now as a coach and a mentor for so many, kind of that transition of not only going from high school to college, but then also college to professional, right? I think that there's a lot of athletes may not be prepared to essentially become adults and navigate right. through the world. Right. What are some ways that you help your athletes as they make a transition? I think it's something that we always talk about. We always talk about, you know, having a, a, a good solid plan, you know, post your, your professional career, making sure that we keep our hands in you know, whatever they're interested in, whether it's, if it's film or if it's journalism or if it's business or whatever they want to have on our hands in it, you know, doing some shadowing, doing some quote unquote unofficial type internships with some folks that they respect in the business world. We always kind of want to be able to make a very smooth and seamless transition into our second career as a professional, not being done and then sitting on the couch for six months to a year trying to figure out and think that uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I've been fortunate that all the athletes that I've had the opportunity to work with, they have left and moved on into 
professional careers and they're doing as well as those professional careers as they did as professional athletes. So that's one thing that we're really, really proud of. And you just have to talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. We don't want it to become a surprise. And the reality is that everybody will retire at some point. So it's not, it shouldn't be something that's taboo to talk about between coach and athlete. It should be something that we discuss all the time. Not that we're trying to rush you to retirement, we're just trying to prepare you for retirement mm -hmm. and, uh, and have all our ducks in a row, so to speak. So when that day comes, we move right into it seamlessly. Nice. And then uh, just last two questions. So can you talk about who some of your role models were as you were growing up? So as you were young and getting into the sport, you know, of course at Arkansas you spoke about some of the legendary coaches that you got to work with. Um, but did you have any role models either in track and field or even just outside of the sport that you looked up to? A hundred percent. Oddly enough, my uh, my high school basketball coach, I, I hooked in high school too, Larry Hendricks, he was a huge influence on me wanting to be a coach and a teacher because, uh, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time playing basketball, but we spent a lot of time, you know, working on farms in Texas and doing all kind of work and cow, uh, uh, herding cows, and picking watermelons and building fences and digging ditches and things like that. He taught us, he taught me and my brothers the, the, the value of being able to work, get your hands dirty, work hard, have long days and et cetera. And uh, it taught us that uh, there's a lot of value in education and being informed about what's going on mm -hmm. in the world and giving back and making sure that you just being a good citizen every day. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's kind of where it started. You know, growing up as an athlete, we really looked up to guys like, you know, Carl Lewis and, uh, you know, Lee Werberell. Yeah. You know, those guys are everything. Butch Reynolds, yeah. um, really, you know, guys like Quincy, Quincy Watson with peers now, but I remember running a 400 and, and watching Quincy being one of the younger guys at the time, and he was awesome. <laughs> Michael Johnson, yeah. you know, from an athlete standpoint. Coaching-wise, coaches like Barbara Jacket uh, from Prairie View University, University, uh, uh, Coach Fry, yeah. Bobby Kersey, John Smith, uh, all these guys that, you know, came before me. I read so many different articles on you know, all these coaches, all these coaches growing up, I used to print the articles when things were pre-printed. Mm. I still have those articles to this day. And every now and again, I go back and just read them. And I, I used to think about, you know, when I had the opportunity to, you know, do my thing that, you know, I would make sure that I'm doing things as well as them. I would say the biggest coaching influence probably on me was probably, and still to this day, uh, was Bobby Kersey. Mm. Uh, I always thought Bobby was, you know, on the, uh, cutting edge of training and, and technology and this sort of thing, but moreover, just the hard work yeah. and the effort that he put into his athletes. And Coach Kersey and I are peers now, but he's still one of my biggest idols uh, in the sport. And my job is to go out and kick his butt, you know, every time. So we always have, a, you know, nice rivalry going on right now. At one point, it was he had Don Harper and I had Brian O'Rollins McNeil, and uh, you know, now he has Sidney McLaughlin, and, and I, we work with Dalila Muhammad. Yeah. So it was like we just always kind of uh, you know end up butting heads and it's and it's all we always need each other to finish line with a big hug at the end of the season, but you know throughout the season we're going at it you know pretty tough, <laughs> uh, but you know he's one of my biggest track and field idols me and John Smith, and uh, I get to work with these guys all the time and uh, share the track a track with John over at West LA mm -hmm. for a period of time and just getting that with opportunities sometimes it's surreal it's like. Man, I grew up reading about these guys and I love these guys and now we work together on a lot of things and, and they respect me as their peer. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, it's been a fun ride, you know, so far and I uh, hopefully we can continue to, you know, make strides in, in, in the sport and, uh, and give back and make a difference uh, where we need to. Yeah. Just uh, one other question before I get to my final kind of different question, but um, just thinking of what you've done, right? You were mentioning, you know, Dawila Muhammad, you've coached um, uh, Brianna Rollins McNeil, you've coached even Kron Clement, um, Queen Harrison, right? Mm -hmm. A plethora of well accomplished hurdlers, and you're known as the hurdle mechanic. Yeah. But you also have coached and do coach a plethora of different flat sprinters, right? I mean, yeah. you have like Bryce Dedman, I think, yeah. and yeah. Will London, I yeah. think, right? Yeah. So yeah. do you. How, how do you like approach that where maybe the public sees you as a hurdle coach but you got some quality sprinters yeah I think by and large I think that if you ask you know the average you know knowledgeable track and field fan they would certainly make that association with Boogie Johnson hurdle mechanic hurdles but I think that you know 
you know, when I coached at Virginia Tech, I've coached at Southern Illinois, I've coached at Clemson, and we've always coached sprinters along the way. Yep. Um, um, I think that, you know, I think, and I love the art of hurdling because, you know, it's a real technical event. You really got to get your hands dirty. You got to really coach. You got to really be a mechanic. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, venturing off into coaching more professional sprint athletes now is just me showing that me wanting to to, to not only show the world but show different athletes that yeah. you know my philosophy is always if I can coach you going over things I certainly can coach you when there's nothing in the way there's no obstacles <laughs> I, it's just uh, uh, I think that I'm intelligent enough and studied enough to get it done mm -hmm. and uh, we've been fortunate to have some some good sprinters in the camp now young sprinters in the camp now and it, it wasn't like I was adverse to it initially, but I really wanted, I had set a lot, a lot of goals. Yeah. I wanted to have a world champion and Olympic champion in high hurdles. I wanted to have a world champion and Olympic champion in the women's four the hurdles. Yeah. And I think after you kind of start checking the boxes of some things you want to do, now we got to, you know, branch out a little bit. Yeah. Now we like to have an Olympic champion, a world champion in the men's 400 and the women's 400 and the 100 and the 200. So just moving along, check the box. I think my ultimate goal was is to have a, a world champion or Olympic gold medalist in the uh, in the steeplechase. Uh, um, I think that checked my last hurdle box right there. So and I think we can get it done. So I'm very ambitious as it relates to these things. Uh, uh, willing to do the work and just study and to make it happen. And excited about coming out to the track every day. So why not? Nice. We gotta we gotta get some of the distance athletes to hit you up. Yeah. <laughs> get yeah. that simple chase box yeah. checked off. Yeah. So that kind of does lead to my last question. Um, so you compete in the 400, um, but if you can compete in any other event that's not your primary event, and you may have dabbled like you've gone up, gone down, but something completely out there, what event would you choose to have competed in? I think you know, knowing what I know now. I think I definitely would have competed in the point of hurdle event. Mm. Beautiful event. Yeah. It takes a, I think it really, if it's a look back, it had all the things that I was good at. I wasn't the fastest sprinter, but I was strong, could yeah. run good 600s and fives. Yeah. Um, uh, was kind of athletic and always had, was really flexible and had yeah. good hip mobility. So yeah. I think that if I had to really start my career with, maybe I'd give myself another three inches in height <laughs> and, uh, and I'd run the men's for the hurdles. I think that would have been a lot of fun. Oh man, do you, what do you think you could have run? I mean, they, they hit 45s now. <laughs> I know, that's 45 is, if 45 is like a walk in the park for some of these uh, stud athletes today. Man, I, th I tell you what, if I could have run your 48 mid back in my day, <laughs> I would have been happy as uh, as anybody, uh, but uh, to 48 doesn't buy you a cup of coffee to, to today's standards, so right. maybe I had to get my game up a little bit right. more. <laughs> I, I was actually speaking with uh, with Steve Lewis right. and Mark Everett, right. and they also said that they would have done 400 hurdles, yeah. but they say back in the 90s, they probably could have run 45 in the hurdles. So Listen, I, I don't disagree. I think, mm. you know, the quarter mile was certainly better in the 90s and in the 80s than it is now. No shade against the guys that we got out here now. But those cats were running under 44 seconds pretty consistently yeah. back in the day. Yeah. Lee Evans and all these guys, they were doing it. So now we get a guy under 44 seconds, it's like a big deal. But back in the gap, it was like five or six dudes. Yeah. And then he came in 44 seconds, it wasn't nothing but a thing. Nothing, no, you got fifth, sixth. Yeah, so I'm like, the quarter mile was a better event back mm. in the day. It was a lot, certainly a lot more consistent and more competitive and I think we have to really work to get back there yeah. now uh, those guys were beautiful athletes back in the day and I think sometimes we, we uh, lose some of those athletes to different sports football and basketball yeah, and what have yeah, you yeah. where track and field was kind of more of a primary sport back yeah. then because it was the money wasn't in the NFL or NBA like it is now yeah. But uh, hopefully one day we'll get back there. But uh, no, those guys probably could have got it done. They were big and athletic enough. Certainly Steve Lewis, yeah. um, uh, uh, he's he's a horse of an athlete. And I think that cat could have set his mind. I think anything he set his mind uh, up to do, he could have got done. Yeah. If Calvin Davis could do it, yeah. if Calvin is my boy. Yeah, yeah, if Calvin Davis, Davis could do it, certainly somebody like Steve Lewis could do it. <laughs> and Calvin was gritty as they come. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh man, really do appreciate it. I really appreciate you dropping so much knowledge and yeah. dropping so much information and so many different things um, yeah. for athletes. Not only like you know you're a coach, you get technical, but yeah. like there's a lot of other things that go into an athlete. Yeah. So appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, I, I enjoy the sport of track and field on all levels. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm really you know proud of the work Dwayne Ross has done over at North Carolina A and T. Mm -hmm. Uh, growing up in the Preview, uh, Texas area, and, and being on that campus every day, it was always a dream of mine. I used to tell my little brother all the time, he's associate head coach of Arkansas, and I used to tell him all the time, I said, man, one day we just come home and take over this program at Preview and just set the world on fire. So Dwayne got that opportunity to beat me to it, being over the A&T <laughs> from the HBCU standpoint, but super proud of the work that he that he yeah, got yeah. done when, when he was at A&T. And I wish him a lot of luck and many blessings as he makes his move to the University of Tennessee. Tennessee yep. Beautiful. Well, Lawrence Johnson, Louis Johnson, Hurdle Mechanic, thank you so much. Really You're very welcome. It. No yeah. doubt. <laughs>